occupational health. So those are people in the workplace. But your workplace could be a hospital. You could be a school nurse or social worker. Maybe it is a big company and they have health people on site. Or they at the very least have a ton of health safety issues, just preventing falls. I interviewed a guy in the UK. He actually was part of a team of a company based here in Pittsburgh, I believe. But he had to figure out, well, okay, what's going to keep them safe in the places people think of all the time, like in the factory? But also, what if they're just walking down the hallway in the marketing department? You know, nice area, no major equipment usually in your way what is going on there. So he still has to figure out all these occupational health issues. Yet I saw a study from JOEM, the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, and the abstract notes that fewer than one-third of the occupational experts, one-third of the participants, fewer than that, reported their employer was prepared for a bioterrorism attack, and 75% in the study Three quarters of the experts, folks, reported feeling unprepared to provide mental health counseling after a terrorist attack. And that's one of the things that truly breaks my heart. As I say, a 9-11 survivor, even though I was nowhere technically near downtown, I watched what it did to my husband after he made it back home. I remember the fear of not seeing him ever coming home not being sure where he was for something like five or six hours, all right? And yet try and go find mental health, not just for me, but anyone. It's always on the talk shows afterwards. We urge all the families who've lost people or if your, your loved one was affected, whether they were a teacher here or the gym instructor over there or the barkeeper, um, get them into mental health. Well, fine then I want to see reports pitched to Facebook or email me and I'll tell you how. But give me information on how folks are really supposed to find mental health in the United States of America. We don't have enough mental health counselors overall. We don't have anywhere near enough in the VA if they're recovering and talking finally about PTS, not just in this current war, but keep going back. The first Gulf War, the Korean War, Vietnam, whatever you want to throw in, let alone if you've been part of one of these terrorist attacks. Where do you find the mental health pros? Most of the ones who are qualified are booked up to their gills. If you find one who's open, can you always get to that person? There's no mass transit. You just can't hop on the bus or the train. Do you have the dollars for the outside fare? Is there a call-in option if you're in desperate need of help? Because again, it says uh, get to the late nearest emergency room. What if you can't get there? So it becomes very difficult. And we really don't figure on people with a special needs. If they've been hit and they're in trouble and they need to get immediate health care, and then what happens when they do need long-term care, whether it's getting to PT, whether it's, uh, again, mental health counseling, Whatever. How do older adults who can't drive anymore, people with disabilities who for whatever reason were never able to drive. I know someone, dear, who has always had low vision. When hubby isn't around, they've always made sure they transplanted to an area where she could walk to the grocery store or get to some sort of real transportation. When you don't have that, here in the States, both FEMA and the American Red Cross have put together insights on disaster preparedness for people with disabilities and other special needs. I believe that's the full title. Disaster preparedness for people with disabilities and other special needs comes from FEMA and the American Red Cross. Have any of you health pros or hospital leaders or anyone in healthcare ever heard of this, found it? It's a very easy to read item. Just type it in online. Again, disaster prep for people with disabilities and put FEMA, let's say, after it, and it should come right up for you. I suggest you not only download it, but make sure you have copies to give to patients and families. Get it to all the nurses and so forth. Among the pointers for 
regular people, but the health pros, especially those of you who are the primary caregivers, the gatekeepers, as you've been called for more than 20 years now. Do your patients and or their families have adaptive feeding devices? And so are there special utensils, for example, readily available? Do you have an extra set that's packed into a goodie bag to grab and take when a disaster comes in of some kind? Okay. Do you have them so you could bring them to a hospital after the attack? Will the hospital let you or are you sure your nearest med center has these kind of special utensils? If you visit them regularly, then please God, they know your loved one and they have this kind of setup. But again, it could be in a grab bag. They may not let you totally use them, but they might if they sterilize them properly. So does the family have backup generators? If somehow a terrorist attack is not shooting, what if it's a bomb of a nearby power plant, God forbid? Okay, do you have backup generators? Do you keep water supplies in the house? I'm in a condo. It has an elevator. It has backup, but it goes mostly dark. There are some dim lights, so you don't want to be running around. How far up are you if you're on the 6th, 8th, ninth floor, especially if you're older, if you're disabled, even temporarily, you've just had your knee surgery. Do you have bottled water in the house? Do you have things like canned goods? You may not enjoy having your cold beans or whatever, but at least it's food and it's there. Anything you can use for nutrition, as I say, the health pros have to remind people. This does not sound like fun. I'm sure it's not in most CMEs and CEs for the health professionals, but it should be. And trust me, I know I have interviewed health providers. And when I asked a leader of the Alzheimer's group at one point uh, who was saying, well, they have to start checking for early onset, I said, well, are you training the primaries for that? They say they have a 15-minute window for regular appointments, just for general checkups. So imagine if he admitted they're not sure how the, the primaries are going to work in early onset Alzheimer signals. How are you going to get time to talk emergency care, terrorism, post-terrorism care? Have you reminded patients and families to at least have one week backup of medications to grab. I mean, seriously, uh, very least have the list. Make sure it's in a purse or a wallet, you have to remind people. Because they need that even when it's not a desperate emergency <laughs> uh, of terrorism, when it's some other kind of thing and they go to the ER. If you're visiting someplace new, they may not have your records. All of this is very short advice. There are so many more stats I could find on terrorism. There's so much more advice for the health professionals about pre-terrorist attack preparations and after disaster relief. But our listeners in health must, I repeat, they must, this is the bottom line, do better in prepping for terrorist attack. And remember, it's got to be sneak events. If you warn people that, okay, when you come in on October 2nd, we're doing a fire emergency, a lot of people, you know, they don't believe this is serious. And you go through certain routines and so you're not truly prepped when the real disaster occurs. People are banging into each other, throwing people down. People are getting hurt by literally being walked over. But again, when I mention things like factory safety, if you trip just because there's a step, it doesn't really look like a step, as you come off the factory floor and you go into the main office, maybe there's just this slight change. Well, people are going to trip one way or the other? You know, not good. Anyway, I'm sorry this wasn't cheerful. We're usually telling stories of inspiration here at Partners in Health and Biz, and I do want to apologize again to the folks who were supposed to be on the show, Tracy Duberman and Robert Sachs, to discuss insights from their book, From Competition to Collaboration. But as you hear this, uh, you'll maybe finding out more, you will eventually be finding out more about when we're going to get that program on the air. You'll, the episode actually relates to what I just urged. You'll hear them talk about how we've had great programs of all kind put in place in healthcare, and then we just don't merge them into a true solution. This hospital's got this idea for health records and that place that actually designs them has different ideas and the outpatient clinic is doing something else altogether and they're not meshing. If we can't figure out HR, uh, EHR, 
if we can't figure out just the billing part, then how are we supposed to refine how we're going to answer terrorism in healthcare? All right, this is not about shooting back. This is not about revenge. We're trying to help people. If you have ideas or programs that could help in this healthcare fight and response in uh, handling terrorist attacks, God help us, if you're providing grant money for research for new ideas in health care, then please contact me at wendyjm.ph at gmail.com. And you can also use that wendyjm.ph at gmail.com if you'd like a direct link to the Norway study I talked about. Anyway, um, oh, and yes, before I forget, for questions about advertising in 2019 or possibly being a guest, that's something far more cheerful, trust me. You can contact me at wendyjm.ph at gmail.com. Also, please, folks, check out my main website, wmmedcom, M-E-D, my main website, wmmedcom, M-E-D-C-O-M-M dot com. And you'll see my contact info there, other ways for quick reaching out as we look to, at this point, another quarter in health communications, print online, B2B, B2C. That's why I could do the research and find what I needed for this program. Tune in next week at 9 a.m. for my partner, Gail Dixon, and her next wellness topic. Of course, don't forget to keep checking us out on Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn. Gail actually did the usual audio that you'll hear on other episodes, but you're going to hear something, you have heard something dif different in the intro, and I'm going to check out with it. I remind you, we'll, this is Spreaker.com, and also look for us at our main website, partnersinhealth.biz, which, by the way, we are in the midst of updating. Look at us at partnersinhealth.biz. Again, I am Wendy Meyeroff, the co-anchor on the biz side. Despite the sadness, have a good week. As we ease out, I'll play music again that I downloaded from B, as in Bumblebee, BMP3. And it's called appropriately Teardrop. And so, by all means, listen to it. I have it on for several minutes. I clipped out. Listen to it. Calm yourself. Meditate. Just think quietly and will let teardrops quiet you down. <music>